100 kilometers above the Earth's surface lies an invisible frontier, the edge of space. This is the Karman line, the boundary between our planet's atmosphere and what lies beyond. What does it take to cross that line? Selection for space is an exhaustive process. Astronaut candidates must be fit, physically and mentally, to endure the rigors of training. High intelligence is essential, while bravery is a useful character trait. The current crew of astronauts have trained for work on the International Space Station, while others are working towards missions yet to come. They have one thing in common. They all consider themselves lucky. I never planned to, to become an astronaut. I mean, I knew that uh, it's, it's a very small likelihood. And so as a scientist, I knew the statistics, meaning like, OK, if I, if I try to become an astronaut, probably won't work out. So for me, applying uh, with ESA to become an astronaut was not as much a thing of me believing that I would become an astronaut, but more trying to give my dream a chance that I had, that I, that I knew I would always looking forward or, or trying to, to see, do I have a chance to actually go there? It also helps if you know how to use one of these. I find my background as a pilot very helpful, just in the, the way that I've previously been taught uh, how to um, follow procedures, for example, as a pilot, um, communication methods, working together in a team and in an international environment. All of those sort of skills are very useful in this job. Of course, I had uh, expectations before I started. Um, but the job is, as an astronaut is, is so unique, I think it's, it's difficult to, to have a realistic sense of, of what to expect. So certainly some things have been what I expected. I mean, the excitement, the uniqueness, the, the wonder of human spaceflight is exactly what I thought it'd be. Uh, other things, of course, have, have been different simply because it's, it's such a unique world to train uh, for a mission. Letter. Okay. Careful, and I'll just follow you. And we'll sit down there. We'll Space training in Europe begins at the European Astronaut Center in Cologne, Germany, where trainees learn the essentials of maintenance and repair of onboard systems. We would be asked to actually either move or clean or just inspect the filter. We would need to close the line. They also continue their basic EVA training in another unfriendly environment, underwater. In general, the, the training at the different locations uh, varies quite a bit. Uh, first, there's the technical side, which means like we're training in Japan on the systems that Japan supplied to the space station. In Russia, we're training on the Russian segment of the International Space Station. In the US, we train for the US side. And at ESA, we train for Columbus and ATV, which are the modules that ESA supplied to, to the space station. Next, the candidates move on to NASA's larger Johnson Space Flight Center in Houston, Texas for extensive EVA training. Training at the GSC is always uh, very busy because we do many different things and it's a huge facility so we're moving all the time from one building to the other. Like here we are in the building 9 where we have a replica of all the 
uh, American modules of the space station. So in this building we train for the space station. Some of it is daily operations, some of it is actually off nominal operations like emergencies. Like in these mock-ups in this building, uh, just yesterday I did a five-hour emergency simulation with my crewmates, with our full crew complement of six people of Expedition 42. And that of course is not something that you would call uh, daily uh, operations, that's something that we really don't want to happen, but we train it a lot because emergencies would put us as crew in danger. HCN. One decimal two. The great thing about being trained on emergencies is that it, it gives you a state of mind. Having the knowledge, having the training can help you in any, in any situation, in any condition, just like it happened to me uh, during my EBA. It was an unexpected emergency that we had not been trained for, but because you have received training that it's all encompassing, it gives you the state of mind where you look forward to the solution rather than focusing on the problem. EVAs, extravehicular activities, sound routine enough. But spacewalks, as we know them, are among the most dangerous duties an astronaut must carry out. Preparation and safety conscious planning are critical. Behind me, you see a lot of equipment which is related to the airlock operations in case of a spacewalk, so we train this here as well. But there's also another completely different facility, which is the Neutral Buoyancy Lab. That's a huge pool, and in there we train for spacewalks underwater. Neutral buoyancy training tanks are in place at ESA's Cologne facility and at Star City in Moscow. But JSC has the biggest. EVA training is, is fantastic. It's, it's physically difficult. It's one of the most challenging parts of the training, but it's also one of the most realistic. Uh, when you're in the pool for six hours, uh, you get tired, but at some point you really think you're on the ISS. You look around you, uh, and there's a structure everywhere. Uh, sometimes you even get disoriented because that's what happens in space. It's like a 3D labyrinth of, of uh, technology. It's a maze of technology. There is so much going on here because we not only train space station, but uh, robotics, spacewalks, so it's uh, um, a very complex training system and it's, it's very exciting to be part of it. I think one of the hardest parts of the astronaut's job is to retain all this different information over the two and a half year period from being assigned to actually launching. Um, yeah, there's an awful lot of information on the Soyuz, on the space station itself, robotic training, EVA training, the list goes on. So um, to try and retain all that, uh, the way that they do that is just by having a refresher training really along our path to launch. JAXA, Japan's space agency, trains astronauts in the operation of the country's ISS contribution, the Kibo Experiment Module, with its space exposure platform. Oh, so this is nominal. I guess it has a very Japanese flavor to it. I mean, the, the content and the, the way the content is presenting and delivered is pretty much standardized. But of course, uh, you know, the, the instructors are Japanese. The, they have that um, very polite, very kind uh, uh, Japanese way about them. In Saint-Hubert, Quebec, the Canadian Space Agency's mobile servicing system operations complex schools astronauts in using robotic arms on station. Here's a station uh, at scale, and here's a robotic arm also at scale. It moves and we can plan our maneuvers. As you can see, the main challenge is to not hit anything while you're moving this arm, because all you got, really, when you're working, if you come here, is this workstation. You got a couple of camera views to work from. You got your hand controllers to move the arm, and you get the, you know, some computer displays and a bunch of switches here on the left. That's all you got, so you really gotta think ahead uh, how you're gonna maneuver this arm without crashing into anything, because of course uh, that would be a very bad day on orbit. Star City near Moscow in Russia was the birthplace of manned spaceflight. It remains a key training center where all ISS assigned trainee astronauts go through the program. When you first start in Star City, you, you immediately feel that you're, you're part of, of something bigger than just your own personal history, because your personal story, because you see people who've been here since the beginning. Um, there's even supposedly Yuri Gagarin's wife is still living here, even though she's very old, she's still living in the vicinity. Uh, so you just cross people in the corridor and they've, they've known all those guys and I was just a kid and those guys were already in, the, in human spaceflight. So um, you try to learn as much as you can, you try to 
um, do your best for the technical side of the job and, and try to interact as much as possible with the people because they're so experienced that they have a lot to give you. Expecting the unexpected is a basic training principle, like landing off course after the mission or touching down in the Siberian tundra. As NASA has no manned flight hardware of its own at present, the agency purchases seats on Russia's Soyuz spacecraft. All astronauts must be trained on the Soyuz systems, which poses a problem of its own. Everything is, of course, in Russian. All the documentations in Russian in the Soyuz spacecraft, and of course all the conversations in Russian as well, which is the reason for us having all of the Russian lessons during our training flow. Not only must you know the Russian language, when in Russian spacecraft, you must also wear Russian spacesuits. When the Sokol space suit actually pressurizes, things do become much more difficult to work because um, you're kind of fixed in your seat in a very rigid location and it's hard to bend your arms and bend your fingers in, in fact so even just sort of reading the board documentation can be quite difficult but hopefully you won't be pressurized when you do a normal descent hopefully the, the spacecraft will come down without any problems and your spacesuit will be much softer which makes it easier to move. Here in uh, Star City I'm using most of my time in the Soyuz simulator together with my commander Suddenly it's starting to feel a lot more real, you know, when you're sitting in the Soyuz and you're really going through the whole launch and landing sequence. You can feel that you're, you're getting close to the date and it's very, very exciting. It's a very well-oiled machine, this, this flow to launch, and I'm confident that, you know, by the time every astronaut flies, you're really ready to go, you're prepared in every way. As things stand, an astronaut bound for a six-month mission to the ISS needs up to five years training a requirement which will in all likelihood be intensified for future missions to deep space. The ISS will probably be used as a long-duration astronaut training facility for missions to Mars and beyond. We are also all people that are selected to be able to get along with each other. Uh, that's kind of like you, the way you select astronauts nowadays for, nowadays for long duration space flights. You really want to have people that are balanced, that are easy to get along with other people. So much of our work up there is determined by the visiting vehicle traffic. And that's a very dynamic um, phase because we're not quite sure exactly which vehicles are going to arrive when. And these vehicles bring up a lot of science, they bring up a lot of hardware uh, that is, determines when the EVAs are done, uh, and also they of course determine the robotics activity that goes on to capture the vehicles. So when you're not quite sure what the visiting vi vehicle schedule is like, you're not quite sure exactly what science and when it's going to be done on board the space station. One six months increment for the whole crew is around 300 experiments, uh, out of which there's 55, 60 for, uh, for ESA. So there's a wide array of, uh, of domains like medicine, um, technology, um, material science, fluid science, um, everything you can think of. We're trying to make the most of the, the conditions in space and the, and the microgravity to, to get results that wouldn't be possible uh, to achieve on Earth. So one of the things I've learned is you just have to be extremely flexible and we get trained on how to do tasks that, that may be planned six months ahead of our mission and may be planned six months after our mission so that should there be some flex and those activities fall within our increment then we're trained and we're ready to do those as well. There's some leftover smell. Whoa. <laughs> Not good. Not good. Looking out of the window is really one of the most fantastic experiences that you can have from the International Space Station. Our Earth is so beautiful, 
And yet, when you look outside, you see that the atmosphere that surrounds our Earth is so thin. It's merely like an eggshell around an egg. It's so fragile. And the vulnerability, uh, the fragility of our planet is very, very visible from on Earth. You see this blue ball and then above nothing, just black, absolutely nothing in this immense universe. And I would hope that more people would be able to fly to space, more maybe of our politicians, decision makers, decision makers would be able to fly to space and really see the vulnerability of our planet so that we can finally start doing something about climate change. just so prepared. All the emergencies, all the possible failures, we train them over and over and over again. So we were supposed to be able to handle any situation. We sat in the simulator hundreds of hours. Uh, we know the systems inside out. So there's nothing really that we fear, I think, on the technical side. Even with all that training, astronauts are well aware of the dangers of space flight riding a rocket full of explosive fuel, living in an enclosed environment with a thin sheet of aluminium between you and hard vacuum, solar and cosmic radiation, bullet-like micrometeorites and space debris. Then there is the threat of onboard fire or mechanical failure, and to cap it all off, the fiery return to Earth. There is, however, one problem that returning astronauts cannot avoid, and that's gravity. When you get back home, of course, uh, I will always remember this was the same for my first flight or for my second flight. The moment they open up the hatch and you feel this fresh, cold air coming into your capsule. This is really something. And you're out there, of course, in the step. You have this real soil kind of uh, smell that you have. It's, it's really feeling fantastic. And then they get you out of the capsule. And the first thing, of course, that you want to do is to contact your family, your friends, say, I'm all right, everything is great. We will see each other uh, tonight. And then you just want to rest and to sleep because you're so tired, of course, from this long day of coming back. And also the gravity is really then having an impact on your body. You you can't, uh, it's difficult to stand up, it's everything that you have to lift, it's hard, it's, uh, it's difficult and this takes a couple of days uh, but after a couple of days of course you recover well. We have a very good recovery program uh, here at our European uh, Astronaut Center. Our uh, people are really very focused on getting the astronaut back up to the level as he was before the flight as soon as possible and then of course it's uh, again after a while business as usual. I'm reaching the end of my career and I'm being able to to do a last flight and really, again, put at work for myself, but also for everybody else, all the knowledge and know-how that I've acquired during this year. It's a very great opportunity and I'm, and I'm really happy uh, that I've been assigned for this. There is another way of crossing that unseen line on the edge of space, by paying your own way as the ultimate tourist. A number of wealthy individuals have already done so. Soon enough, it will become cheaper and accessible to the ordinary mortal, provided he or she can pass the medical. You know, when, when our test pilots and, and wonderful team that run Virgin Galactic say uh, that it's, we're ready and ready to go, uh, then, you know, I'll be ready to climb in and, and, and you know, be, be the, you know, the first, um, the first passenger as such, um, you know, to go to space and to become an astronaut. Um, and from there, hopefully, thousands of people will follow me.